Hello, Kim Eagle for ACC.org. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I have three wonderful guests today. We're covering the third day of the American Heart Association meetings that are in Philadelphia, November 13th. There's so many great trials uh, at this meeting, and I have three guests who are experts in trials to summarize several of the important ones that will be released today. I have R.J. Kirtani from New York City, Kyle Coley from Denver, Colorado, and Darren Kabani from Dallas, Texas. We'll start with a trial called Espirit. Kyle, take us away. You know, Kim, the last day of the meeting is always a little bit of a heavy heart to be leaving our friends and colleagues in the science. But this trial, I'm definitely taking home with me to my patients, and it's going to change my practice. So this trial really asks the question if 120 should be the new 130 when it comes to high-risk cardiovascular patients and their blood pressure targets. Now, if you recall, the SPRINT trial in the past did ask that question of whether targeting a blood pressure less than 120 actually reduced MACE, and we found that it did. But the difference between that trial and this one is that that trial had very few Asians, less than 2%, and it also had no diabetics and no patients with a prior history of stroke. So this particular trial studied 100% Asian population because it was run out of sites in China, had about 39% diabetics and about 27% of patients with a prior stroke, and really enriched patients who didn't just have hypertension, but either already had established cardiovascular disease or had two or more risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So a nice large trial, more than 11,000 patients randomized to either blood pressure goal less than 120 or less than 140 and had a median follow-up of 3.4 years. And what they found was there was actually a 12% lower incidence of major vascular events, a 39% lower cardiovascular mortality, and a 21% lower all-cause mortality in patients when they were you know, given the blood pressure goal of less than 120 as compared to the standard of less than 140. So really what that came out to for is every thousand patients treated with that more aggressive blood pressure goal for three years, you prevented 14 major vascular events, eight deaths. However, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And so you did have three patients who had a more serious adverse event of syncope. So to me, certainly I was already doing 130 for some of my higher risk patients, but this trial gives me the message that I need to personalize perhaps even farther, maybe even think about pushing my patients down to 120. One thing I will say is that the 120 versus 140 to me is a little bit of a flawed comparison because most of us in clinical practice are targeting 130 already for some of our very high risk patients. But I might start now thinking about the 120. The questions that I'm sort of left with moving forward is who are those three patients that had more syncope? In other words, how do I characterize, is it the older patients? Is it the ones on other blood pressure medications? Those are the studies that I'm looking for coming out of this trial to see what, whether I could better characterize or predict which patients are likely to have adverse events. But certainly lower seems to be better for blood pressure, just like with LDL cholesterol. That's really what I'm taking home with me today. Yeah, I really like your analysis of this trial. It's an important one. If we knew that the patients with a lower diastolic pressure were the ones who were going to faint, or if there were subgroups there that, uh, that we could identify, that might be very helpful. You know, we've been calling 120 to 130 prehypertension, um, and this trial suggests that, yeah, this is real, and lower is better if we can do it safely. That's a great summary. I appreciate that. Now, Darren, there was a trial that we didn't get to uh, on Saturday that, that actually is pretty important, perhaps, for our patients having cardiac surgery called MINT. Will you give our audience just a sense of that trial? Yeah, no, thank you. I'm glad we're talking about this. You know, Saturday was such a, you know, busy day, a lot of important trials. Um, and I think this trial is no less important. And so, you know, really glad that we are able to talk about this. So uh, the MINT trial, um, this was uh, looking at a very common question of whether or not, uh, you know, we need to transfuse patients who uh, are anemic and were presented with an acute MI. Now, importantly, they included patients both with spontaneous or type 1 MIs as well as those with type 2 MIs. And, you know, 12 to 13% of patients in this, in this study were actually intubated, um, you know, at the time of randomization. So this was a very large endeavor. Uh, you know, the trial was run across six countries. And, um, and uh, what they were trying to primarily see is if you presented with, as I mentioned, an acute MI and you were anemic, which was defined as a hemoglobin of less than 10, 
Uh, did you benefit from sort of what they call the more liberal transfusion strategy, which is you you transfuse to keep the hemoglobin above 10, 10 or higher, uh, or sort of a more restrictive strategy where you um, sort of tolerated a hemoglobin of 7 to 8 and really were encouraged to transfuse if your hemoglobin was less than 7. And, you know, this has been studied in some other trials before. Uh, you know, they were all the, the summation of these the, the total sample size of these other trials was around 800 or so. This trial alone enrolled 3,500 patients, so it was significantly larger than all the other trials. And they indeed, uh, you know, the, the top line results, the primary endpoint, which was death or MI at 30 days, was actually um, non-significant just from a pure statistical standpoint. The p-value was 0.06 to 0.07. Uh, in favor of a liberal transfusion strategy. Um, and the lower confidence interval of that was one. Uh, but on the upper side, it was uh, about a 35% potential benefit. Now, you know, they, uh, one thing I will say, they achieved sort of the endpoint, you know, in sort of this unblinded um, scenario, it is sometimes hard to achieve the true endpoint that, or the, the true um, randomization uh, that you try to, uh, that you seek at the, uh, at the outset. And so uh, in the liberal arm, you know, they, on average, patients received about two and a half units of blood, whereas in the, in the restrictive um, uh, strategy, they only received about 0.7, less than one unit of blood over the course of the study. And so, uh, you know, they looked at a number of subgroups. They looked at patients who presented maybe with a type 1 MI, patients where they, where they saw a benefit, uh, and they also saw a benefit among patients who had prior heart failure. So now, again, these have to be viewed in the setting of a otherwise sort of negative trial, but also sort of very promising. So, you know, I think this was a very large endeavor. I think, uh, you know, we owe the investigators a large debt of gratitude for studying this very important question of whether we need to be transfusing patients who present with an MI and are found to be anemic. And I think based on the, uh, you know, based on these results, I would say, you know, again, I think the top line is that it's a negative trial. But based on sort of the borderline significance and the potential for, you know, significant clinical benefit, I would say uh, at least, you know, favor thinking about that on a case-by-case -case basis for certain patients. Thank you for a great summary. It does, you know, I, we've thought about whether if the patient's completely revascularized, you know, there's been a sense from our interventional research and also coronary surgery research that if you're completely revascularized, you're likely to tolerate uh, a lower hemoglobin without, uh, without myocardial injury. Uh, and I don't recall, Darren, if that was uh, studied carefully as a subgroup in this first report? You know, I think, the, uh, you know, about two-thirds of the patients actually had multi-vessel disease. Um, I would have to go back and look and see if yeah. that was actually true. But it's a great question. It will be an important sub-analysis for us to look to to see if it would change our practice. Uh, and the whole, the whole area of blood transfusion and the immune effects of, of blood versus the benefits uh, continues to be debated. Uh, this trial, I think, while promising, probably isn't practice changing just yet. There's another trial that we wanted to cover today called ORFEM. Um, Ajay, can you tell us about this trial? Absolutely. I, I think that the I always think of the AHA meeting as one that's focused on prevention and the best ways in it, uh, on a population health level, uh, sort of figuring out how to take care of our patients in that way. And I, I think to that regard, uh, ORFEM is a forward-looking study. It was basically a study trying to assess whether other markers risk could potentially um, stratify patients into higher risk beyond what we conventionally do. And so this is a study looking at CTAs, and um, they now have up to 40,000 CTAs um, in the UK, and using an AI-based approach to assess fat attenuation or a marker of plaque vulnerability of a sense that could then potentially stratify risk beyond just obstructive disease alone, LDL and all the normal things that we do. Um, they wanted to validate this algorithm in a UK-based population. And what was shown is that um, independent of the degree of obstruction or other conventional risk factors, uh, the degree of fat attenuation, attenuation through this index, and this is an AI-based algorithm that was trained in the US and now being applied in the UK, could actually stratify risk beyond what we normally do. Now, how is that actionable? Well, I think what they've tried to show is that it could potentially then change therapy and potentially increase the uh, the prescriptions of lipid lowering therapies, for instance, specifically. The reason I think that's important is because it was a really important JAX paper that was published last year that showed despite patients having established ASCVD, 
only 20 some percent of patients are on a high dose statin and only 50% of patients are on any statin at all. And so we need to do better. We need to be able to take that teachable moment of when somebody gets a CAT scan back to then say, well, I think it's really important for you to be on this therapy. So exactly as Pyle said, we can have the plaque not cause the event, but just be somewhat of a passenger in the journey of the patient's life. And so whether or not this algorithm can prove to change clinical events that you need outcomes-based studies to show that, but there are other algorithms out there, and this is a keen area of interest, particularly as a lot of the diagnostics and the imaging diagnostics are moving upstream of the cath lab and into the office. So certainly forward-looking from my, from my view. Great, great summary. I agree with you uh, on all the comments that you made. Obviously, AI is changing the game in how we look at imaging. Uh, and I loved your comment about the notion that if you sit down uh, with a patient who has risk factors and suddenly you're looking at their coronary arteries, uh, and factors that might predict risk, it does change their thinking when it's not just a notion, but actually my heart. That really can change the game in terms of their willingness to take uh, medications to prevent uh, future events. You know, we don't have time to cover all the great trials that come out, and there were two other trials that uh, were being released today, but we want you to look for, our team will be covering them. One's called Arise, and another one's called a Stream 2. Uh, they're important trials that uh, you should take a look at. I want to thank uh, all of you for your wonderful summaries today. Uh, for ACC.org, we love covering this meeting for all of you. Uh, and for ACC.org, this is Kim Eagle and saying uh, we're out. <laughs>